I think we're about ready to start. We're good. Perfect. Uh, remember, this is a live session. Um, live television is my speciality. I'm kidding. Uh, but I'm, I'm very uh, grateful for everyone uh, for being here on time and uh, to discuss and, and share thoughts on this important topic. For a second, just imagine if every person around the world could affordably participate in the digital economy. This is the ambitious goal that inspired the creation of the Edison Alliance, a, an incredible movement, a network of leaders across private and public sectors that are promoting change and, and trying to really uh, uh, you know, uh, bring private and, and public sectors, like I said, in a collaboration in three main areas, financial services, education, and, and healthcare. Um, everyone in this room is, is part of that mission in, form or, in some form or, or another, directly or indirectly. Um, and, and today we're focusing on unlocking capital at scale for digital inclusion. Uh, the current estimates suggest that between $400 billion and $2 trillion are needed in order to achieve universal digital inclusion. We're talking about uh, around 1 billion people around the world. So um, the question seems to be how we can mobilize private assets and foster a cooperative policy to achieve uh, an environment that generates this much needed investment in the digital economy and in digital inclusion. And before I introduce the distinguished members of our panel, I want to thank Her Majesty Queen Maxima, uh, the, the Queen of, of the Netherlands, who's here in her capacity as a United Nations Secretary General um, Advocate or Special Envoy on Inclusive Finance. Thank you so much for, for being here. It's an honor to have you, Your Majesty. Thank you so much. Uh, if you could lead us with some introductory remarks and, and talk about why this particular topic of financial inclusion is so close to your heart, and of course, the, the challenge of how we scale action, how we increase action uh, in order to, to achieve a, a more inclusive uh, financial digital world. Well, first of all, thank you, everybody. Uh, you just mentioned my very long name, a title that I have that was given to me by a Secretary General. As things are in uh, the Bretton Woods Institute, sometimes it's a go big negotiation. And you might ask yourself, what is she doing on digital uh, inclusion? Well, to be honest with you, nowadays, if I speak about financial inclusion, we cannot speak about financial inclusion without having a mobile phone and uh, without having access to markets digitally. So um, this is a very, very important part of uh, my work. So what I found myself in this issue, in this transition when I did study 16 years ago with microfinance to all the way to here, that I'm actually speaking about IDs, I'm speaking about connectivity, I'm speaking about, you know, level of handhelds that people are actually using. So I'm completely immersed in this issue of digital inclusion and the importance of actually having um, this in a way that is really, really inclusive. So it's very nice, therefore, to join you as a champion of the Edison Alliance. Um, I have to say that public and private sector financing is our best chance to mobilize the vast resources you just mentioned needed to provide affordable, accessible, and safe digital connections for everyone, especially the, ne the nearly three billion people that still are offline. Eh? This includes the poor, women, smallholder farmers, and MSMEs. The pandemic sapped their resources and made it even more expensive to get connected. New data shows today that the, for the first time in years, fewer, not more, women are using mobile internet, fewer. Many had to choose between owning a mobile phone or putting food at the table. So to avoid a growing digital divide and achieve really universal digital inclusion, the public and private sector really must work and invest together. And I say the Edison Alliance could really make a huge difference. Its goal of actually improving one billion lives uh, through digital solutions by 2025 is a really a call of action to action that we need. Um, we have seen a lot of very encouraging public and commitments from government and industry. So are the tools and products being created to do this. Now, on the digital financial inclusion front, we need not only digital inclusion, but really a set of what I call public goods that together will assure inclusion, stability, and business sustainability. Too often, the digital infrastructure and policies are considered in different silos, but really, these public goods work best actually together. Some 
unlock digital access by expanding, for example, connectivity or agent networks into new areas. Other public goods make markets work better for customers through fair competition and interoperable payment systems, for example. And some others protect the financial system and its users by strengthening data privacy, cybersecurity, consumer protection, digital and financial literacy. Some will be provided by governments and others by the private sector. But in any way, there will have to be a collective effort. We've actually seen interoperable payment systems now coming up in many, many countries. Some of them, we've known the India case is a very, very good one. A system basically supports high number of small value transactions are unlikely to be developed, be developed without government encouragement and innovation and incentive. But then we need to have them because if we don't have that, the small transactions and the poor and the women and the smaller farmers were never going to be able to come in. Proper payments like these were set up in Pakistan, in India. They can increase competition be between providers, drive down costs, allow infrastructure to be shared between competing firms and open the financial system to potentially millions of new customers. For the private sector, this means serving a bigger market. And this will entail other types of products and services. And this, of course, will challenge innovations to their existing business models. This also means that they need to see, sit at the table to help build fair governance structures, rules, and set pricing that makes sense to all stakeholders. And I really want to say this, this issue of actually sitting all together at the table is very important. You cannot, from a government standpoint, come up with something in which the pricing structure is absolutely not right, in which not one uh, private sector uh, player wants to actually participate. Another big example is connectivity. And here, reaching the last mile can be the longest mile. Hmm. Connecting and serving the poor in rural and remote areas affordably can only be achieved through collaboration. But what are those models of cooperation that enable the last mile clients to really get digitally connected? What are the types of regulations and the right incentives for the private sector to invest and serve this last mile? And we must not forget that connectivity also means access to devices and good quality devices. So that to build all these vital digital public goods, we should start, of course, with dialogue. When countries start sharing the knowledge together, we can really learn from what works, such as the Brazil PIX interoperable payment system or the India's stack and the Indian ID system. There are many, many examples, and they do not only come from very big countries, because when I'm speaking about you know, Nigeria, India, or Pakistan, we have amounts of people that we can actually set up several systems that might actually work. But we also have very good examples of countries like Peru, Estonia, that have actually set up these type of uh, corporations that really work with much, much smaller countries. And of course, what is the role of global organizations? They can really help bring governments and private sector together. If I've seen something in all my visits with all my partners is we've been the nexus and the glue to actually bring this dialogue together. Because without that dialogue, we're not going to move the needle on this front. So the World Economic Forum, UNDP, the Bank of International Settlements can also all facilitate discussion and exchange on public, digital public goods. The Gates Foundation and the World Bank Group are really ready to provide capital and technical assistance to many of them. So let us not lose ourselves in discussing what are the competing allocations of is it digital, <laughs> of is it health, <coughs> or is it education. Without digital inclusion, we will not make health possible, we will not make financial inclusion possible, and we're not going to make education for all possible. So if we just sequence our priorities, it will be the way to go. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the good discussion of these very talented people here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Queen Maxima. Uh, we're grateful for your leadership in, in that capacity in the UN as a champion of the Edison Alliance, and of course, for your personal investment and your commitment to this issue. Thank you so much for those introductory remarks. And I'm going to start uh, introducing our panel, a, a couple of housekeeping items. You can share our conversation if you feel inclined to do so on social media using the, the hashtag WEF22. I'm contractually obligated to say that. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. And then, uh, of course, um, feel free to make this an interactive conversation. We, we will have time for, 
for questions at the end and make those questions um, uh, with a question mark at the end so we can move the, the conversation forward. Magdar Diop, the Managing Director of the International Finance Corporation, thank you so much for being here today. Hans Besberg, uh, the Chairman and the CEO of Verizon and the Chair of the Edison Alliance, we're going to talk about a lot today. And Shobana Kimineni, she's the Executive Vice Chairperson of Apollo Hospitals and Board of the Edison Alliance, a board member of the Edison Alliance. Thank you. Thank you so much. We were talking um, off stage in, in the speaker's room about the fact that it's been a year since, around a year since the creation of the Edison Alliance. And Hans, I want to start by asking you, now you have a good um, uh, benchmark to, to, to measure tangible results, to sort of figure out the direction that, that you're heading in. Um, what have been some of the barriers, the main barriers of unlocking capital for digital inclusion? He was going to go back a little bit in time, and, and of course, uh, once upon a time, my dream was to have the goal 18 of the SDGs, and that would be that everybody is connected in the world. We all know that it's 17 SDGs. So, uh, but uh, during the COVID, I think we all understood that the 21st century's infrastructure is actually mobility, broadband, and cloud. Uh, give the same chance for anyone, wherever they come from, wherever they're born, uh, and wherever they live. Um, and actually, it was pretty good progress during COVID. Uh, 800 million people more got connected online during COVID, which is just enormous. 800 we, million people. 800 million people. But we needed COVID to understand it and, uh, and do it. And, uh, but that's far away from where we need to be. We still have 2.9 billion people that are not connected on this planet. Um, so the conversation about the Edison Alliance was, of course, that, OK, what is needed to address that? You need three pieces. You need the accessibility of the technology, you need the affordability, and then usability. And you need private-public partnership to make it happen. And uh, in the early discussion with, Carl, with Klaus Wolb, uh, was about the biggest platform in the world is World Economic Forum, where basically everyone is here. We have the private sector, public sector. We have uh, NGOs and everything. Um, there was the idea, can we launch something here to actually address something much larger when it comes to the digital divide? So we agreed up upon doing that, but we also said that accessibility, affordability, and usability has to be the guiding principle. So we decided to have uh, the leading star in education, healthcare, and financial inclusion based on the, the digital divide, uh, because only having uh, access is not enough. So, uh, we started with a smaller group. We ended up now having 46 uh, champions that all are committed. Uh, they commit a contribution in kind or they're doing something in order to meet the target that we put up for ourselves in September last year, which was 1 billion lives connected by 2025. Additional 1 billion that are, are, are touched upon it. Um, so far, of course, we have a lot of commitment from different companies, countries that is part of it. Uh, we're going to do the first report during the UN week in September. That's one year after we announce it. Uh, I'm extremely encouraged for the capital, the contribution on kind for companies, from private sector, from public sector, in order to make this happen, and the sharing in between them. Is it easy? No, it's super difficult. <laughs> there are many barriers, and capital is one, of course, uh, to see that you have financing for the digital divide. But I'm encouraged what I see. I see now bonds coming out on digital divide. I can actually finance the same money I can finance Verizon's balance sheet with, I can do a digital bond. And I get the same interest rate because the market is now understanding this is important things to finance. Equally as much as I do a green bond, I get the same interest rate on my green bond as the digital bond, as a digital inclusion bond, as the corporate financing I do on my balance sheet. Uh, that is encouraging to see that capital is allocated to this. So that's one thing. There are many other things we need to talk about, of course, because affordability becomes important. Handsets be becomes extremely important, or devices in general. And I probably shouldn't spend too much time in the beginning. But that's the outset of what we're doing. Uh, and uh, it's a five-year journey we're doing, adding one billion people more uh, into the digital world. And, and of course, focusing a lot about the most vulnerable, uh, females that uh, will have the chance, but trying to do it not only talking about I need more broadband. I, if I have the broadband, I need to afford it, and then I need application from healthcare, education, 
or that I can actually use the mobile phone to make in mobile transactions financially as a bank account. So you cannot only talk about one thing, and that's what the Alliance is doing. Of course, we are technology partners, but the leaders, like Shobana, she's leading the healthcare, uh, digital healthcare, uh, and Michael Maybach from uh, uh, MasterCard, he's uh, leading the financial inclusion. And then the education is the Minister of IT from Rwanda. So we, we, we try to lead it not only by technology, because it has to be a combination of it. Yeah, it's pretty clear that the table has three legs, and without any of those yeah, three legs, isn't exactly. just going to be able to, to maintain itself. Um, Shobana, uh, how do we uh, find these this leading business models in sectors like healthcare, for example, that um, are good models for financial uh, digital health services, for, for advancing digital health services, especially in rural areas uh, where they don't have access sometimes to physical space to, to, to the actual services? I think that uh, we're actually fortunate. Health is in a very good space because it makes People think of this as one of the top ESG, so their, their funds, their, uh, whether it's ESG, whether it's CSR, whether it's bonds, everyone is interested to give health a break because they know that it's foundational to a country's development. If, if, if a country is not healthy, if they don't have a healthy population, it's, it's very likely that it's going to impact the GDP very negatively, especially as, as we've seen during COVID. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, I think that solving the problem, and health is a problem, uh, there will be financi uh, financing solutions. We've seen it in, uh, for COVID, for instance, 357 days from the start to a vaccine coming out. It was global, the way that uh, whether it was, uh, it was institutional lending, it was banks, it was uh, CSR, it was foundations, it was countries that were giving money into it. And this is a model that I think is completely replicable when you have a, when you have a good story behind it. But you have to write that up. The problem has to be sharp now. People don't want vague uh, promises of saying that I will, um, I'm, I'm going to cure, um, you know, uh, I'm going to eradicate TB or I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, diagnose all the cancers in the country. They want sharper, they want us to go down into the areas. When we talk about rural, what will you do? How are you going to manage it? And I think that's why the Edison Alliance is, is actually so pivotal in making a billion lives, you know, transforming. Because we can go down and use this digital because, um, Your Majesty, you spoke about it, saying that without digital, you're not going to have the, f the steps to go further down. And this is the kind of inclusion that brings it large and makes it affordable. So that's very important too. I can't go into an Indian village. So the best thing that the Indian government has done is our UPI, when you referred to the stack twice or thrice, I was super thrilled. But it's really true. You, any Indian can just go in there. We don't need credit cards. We don't need cash. You, just, you can go in there, scan a QR card code and it just goes into, for, into your accounts, money gets deposited directly. Having said that, I think it's a huge, it makes a huge impact in, in underserved rural areas because there you have the connections because they, they have, uh, thanks to Hans and all his uh, uh, colleagues around the world, we have connectivity everywhere. And with that connectivity, we can actually provide a teleconsult. We have digital dispensaries. This is something that we're doing in the Edison Alliance. We already have five models up there. And the state governments are financing it. We are doing it. And I think this blended finance is, the world is going to hear more and more about blended finance. Mm. People with different financial, you know, I might need an X return. Someone else might need much less. But we can all work together through a catalyst and, and a long-term program. As long as that there's a problem that needs to be answered, I think that uh, I have great optimism and faith that the, that, uh, uh, the world can, make, you know, can overcome that challenge. In and we keep highlighting the, the need for partnerships. Uh, for sure. Queen Maxima said that during her introductory remarks. Both of you have, have talked about uh, this right balance between uh, public capital complementing itself with private uh, uh, efforts. Um, and and Magdar, uh, how do you hit the right balance between those two, what, what it's needed to, to make this a successful approach? Um, because we seem to have momentum. We have leadership. Uh, 
we all agree that this is a, a crucial uh, project, but then we're starting to see some of the, of, of the main uh, challenges ahead. No, thank you very much. It's happening, actually. I'm optimistic because uh, a year and a half ago, when we had this big shock, it came to in front of us. We were wondering what to do, and we created this speedboat. So we got together, GSMAs, Alliance, uh, ITU, everybody got together and said, we have to solve that problem. We never have that rate of connectivity, never, ever. And it means that when we have a shock and of this nature, we, 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 we are able to get things together. And the challenge is to replicate it and to, and to sustain that effort. And I think that's where we are today. And the solution, I agree with you, is multiple dim dimensions. I would like really to quit my to thank you. Because uh, the, the work that you've been doing on uh, digital ID has been critical in that process. The resilience, uh, 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 the resilience of economy after the shock, during the shock, has been linked to the digital inclusion. Countries and which have been able to connect quickly, have you saw, as you said, we've been able to transfer resources to the poor, to give them medical services, if we didn't have that foundation ID4D, it would have been impossible. So having a, a, so I really would like to commend you for really your leadership on that because you've been the big champion of it. And it came from, from solving a problem. The initial question was how to bring more people to financial inclusion. And we realized that you know, it was not only handing some money, give money, give microcredit here and then. The way to scale it up was to be able to, to connect the people and to give digital IDs. I think that we have also second good news is that part of the world which we are not connected on broadband are receiving now more broadband. Let's take Africa. We have two new uh, uh, submarine cables that have been laid, uh, laid off shore of Africa soon, and we will have 300 giga uh, terabyte yeah. uh, uh, offshore of Africa. Today, for those who don't know, the capacity installed in sub-Saharan Africa is around uh, 30 terabyte or, or less, so uh, uh, a factor of 10. So that's why policy and public and private will be important, because you can bring the, the, the fiber uh, offshore at the cost of a country, but if you are not able to do the last mile to connect the poorest, you are not solving the problem. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the user cases, if you don't have the handheld which is cheap and accessible, if you don't have a uh, uh, share, share infrastructure to allow, to, allow, to allow you to be able to connect uh, the largest number of people to 4G, we are not uh, uh, doing so. It will require really working together. And in addition, if you want to just the poorest country not only to be able to consume services, but also to export and to be part of the world economy, we need to give them skills to be able to do that. I was just talking uh, uh, an hour ago with an uh, uh, edu uh, uh, education service provider. And the model now is to have an hybrid model where they bring a training which is coming from TVT online with the formal degrees. And that's what it is being. So all these developments are only possible if you look at different elements. Lastly, let's not forget cybersecurity. We are at a time where security and is becoming a, a, a big problem, even more than before. And uh, uh, as we are uh, moving in that process, a big role of the government will be really to help on creating the frameworks of policies for cybersecurity. Otherwise, all the efforts that are being put in place might be to be jeopardized in the near future, including uh, for the poorest who will be needing to use all these handsets and all tools. And, and it's incredible to see. Go ahead, Hans. No, I, I just want to add, and I think that's so good that we're, what they're talking about. And sometimes I, I might, we talk high level, and, and then you, you don't feel that the detail enough. But if you think about it, I mean, I, I was fortunate. I was born in a place where I had 500 meters to the school and I had 500 meters to the hospital. We know in the <laughs> continent that you come from, it's going to be a billion people more. Mm -hmm. There's no way we can do physical solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I just wish we think like that, that the only way to actually see that every African that comes up and once being there, the only way for them is actually we have digital solution. And the government needs to understand that that's equally important infrastructure as anybody. Of course, food always comes first. But if they have digital skilling with education, healthcare, they will have the same chance as I had when I was born. But 
we cannot expect that they're going to build brick and mortar because it's just in, impossible practically to do that. And I think that's a mentality we need to start thinking about, that the mobility brought on the cloud is the 21st century's infrastructure, and we need to work like that. And we from the private sector will need to do it, and the public sector need to think like that. And, and that's a very important piece of thinking in order to see that everybody on this planet is going to have the same chance. It, because if you're outside the digital divide, you don't have the same chance anymore. Now, uh, I, I, I just want to, to just rebound two please. seconds on this. Example, you talk about Rwanda. It was a very interesting example. Uh, how people will use technology to leave frog. Uh, it's a mountainous country. It's a country of thousand hills, schools. And build a road is very expensive. Because of the digital and the coverage they have of 4G, people can order blood samples and have it delivered by drone in, on, on a hill. Mm. So that is just a, a, a leapfrogging and make a huge difference in terms of service delivery and health. So I just wanted to give that no, example. No, no. no and, and I think it's, it's a great example. And, and uh, I was, I was going to share a, a personal story. One of my, if not the first assignment I ever had as a reporter back when I worked at a local newspaper in Mexico was to go to the mountains of Guerrero. It's one of the poorest states in, in Mexico in a town called Metlatonoc, which had the, the lowest levels of, of, of human development in, in Latin America. And uh, one of the main reasons for that was that they were isolated. Mm -hmm. It would take women, pregnant women, five hours to get to the nearest uh, clinic or children yeah. hours to walk to school. Uh, and, and when you come to a place like Davos, even today, and you hear these conversations about remote work yeah. and remote education and how healthcare is approaching <laughs> you know, a, a new era where, yeah. where everything's going to be done Almost through digital, everything. this is why this conversation is so important because it complements everything that's being discussed outside uh, the Edison Alliance and what's happening here. Uh, and, and it's important to tell that story, Hans. It, it, it's, yeah. it's part of what you've, you've learned in this, in this uh, few months, first few months of the Edison Absolutely. Alliance. Absolutely, no, no, and there are so many great people. And, and the thing is also what you start to see, you combine that with the social responsibility that many private company takes today. Uh, and, uh, making it part of the strategy. So even if you start thinking, okay, where all is the money coming from? It's actually part of the strategy to be part of doing this for your communities because the communities ultimately are your customers and they're part of your society. So the whole sort of, I came here the first time 2008 and I was super excited. I'd been in Africa somewhere. I saw a mobile phone. Somebody was collecting data from a village and they can detect where the disease came from. Of course, nobody really thought it was a good idea. But <laughs> now, 15 years later, you see everybody start understanding the power of that. But now, the movement has to come. And Shobana, how do we keep that momentum going, especially after the pandemic in sectors like healthcare? We all paid attention to healthcare during the past uh, couple of years, more than ever before, probably in our lives. But how do you keep uh, you know, uh, that attention and that inertia moving forward? Because healthcare has become front and center again, you know, so I, I think that we might uh, move away from, from acknowledging, you know, the that, that COVID is endemic and we just want to forget that period. But it doesn't mean that we're going to forget how to look after our health on one side. So I think that people have become, uh, because of digital, people have, got, have become more aware. It's come into their own hands that they can order a test, that they can find out, that they can consult a doctor, that they can actually do, uh, have their records and, and actually go to those goals, prevent diabetes, attach it to your fitness. So, you know, these kind of things. Now we have early warning trackers of, uh, you know, through your, through your watch, as your EKG comes in, we can say that, you know, it doesn't look good, why don't you come in? So, so there are that, you know, that uh, healthcare has actually become democratized, it's in people's hands. But um, I, I really think that it's also important that we have to make it, uh, that, that it's also highly inclusive by having digital health, we're working on projects in rural India where for $5 a year, really $5 a year, we want to give, uh, we want to be able to, uh, to uh, write up the, a patient's initial record, give them basic medicines, and also do the diagnostic that, that they need per person. And if this can be done at scale, taken to countries, you know, that uh, I think even in rural America or wherever, all over the world, that it led such a cost, affordability. We were discussing yesterday, $100 for a, for a, uh, for a smartphone might be too expensive, you know, for... Of course. 25 is a 
Yeah. So, so that's where we, we need to get, you know, that convergence so people will remember. And the last point I want to say is that it's not just the traditional players that are going to be in healthcare anymore. Mm -hmm. You have the Googles and the Amazons and the Microsoft and just about everybody who's in technology thinks that they can bring a smarter solution to the table. That's a good thing. Innovation, you, you see that? Lots of innovation and, and that is being funded. Talking about, uh, do you, do you, your majesty, you wanted to? No, no, I just wanted to strengthen her point. I've actually been to many places in Africa in which you see the increase of efficiencies just by having digital systems. So we're actually speaking about sort of how do we finance and the health system. And I see what a doctor that used to be filling form for every patient to actually get the insurance company. And it's all done by the phone. So the doctor, instead of actually seeing three patients per hour, he's seeing like 20 patients per hour. It's, yeah. it's, mm. The efficiency is a really very big thing. Now, the one thing is we might actually have capital, but the one problem that I'm actually seeing with a lot of countries that are actually asking for you know, investments in, in the whole digital sphere, they don't have the technical capacity to do this in a sustainable and safe way. So we have to really pay. We talked about cybersecurity here. We really have to be uh, really mindful of the capacity constraints that some of these countries have in dealing with the risks that we're also taking by doing these humongous you know, transitions to doing everything digital. So we really have to be all together globally, think about these digital public goods. What is good practice? What is standard? And there's right now no work being done on this field. And you know, I'm trying to do that with the BIS, BIS and other institutions with the FSB as well, certainly on the financial side, but extremely important. The whole issue of data agency. <laughs> yeah? So these are very, because these are things, you oh, know, things. that will end up destroying also customer trust and also losing it. We also talk about algorithm biases. You know, biases can actually yeah. exclude more than include. So let us be mindful that while we give them people accessibility, affordability, and viability, <laughs> that we also give in a way that is safe yep. and actually will increase trust in the whole system. And yeah. I'm so glad we're getting a specific. Yeah, yeah, and I think this question is so good. Uh, and, and, and sometimes I make things very simple, which they are not. But I will try anyhow. So if you are in a company and you start to digitalizing the whole company, what do you do? I mean, you have a chief information security officer uh, that is seeing that you are resilient, you are resilient with data and all of that. If you are a country and you believe that digitalization is the most important infrastructure you have to include all your citizens in having uh, the data, healthcare data, etc., you need to think that you need a chief information security officer as well sitting and looking over that, that sort of the beginning thinking about the infrastructure equally important as a corporation do as a government. Because you're right, the first time all data from, I don't know, from the healthcare, healthcare system is hacked and out in the market, the trust is just going down for the government. Yeah. Yeah. And then we lose that uh, digital inclusion. And Magda, I want you to react to that, but also I want to add a question, if, if you don't mind. Um, we've talked about capital at the beginning and some of the instruments, financial instruments available, like the bonds. But what other instruments is the IFC putting on the table to make sure that these underserved communities uh, also develop that capacity? With following on country, we're doing blended finance. That's exactly what you said. Actually, we have been investing in your, in, in yes. your company for, for a long time. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's blended finance. For, for low-income countries, they need to have a cost of capital which is lower. Huh? But the good news is that actually the digital space is, is naturally uh, a private sector space. In a, even in the country which are highly dominated by the states, you go to Africa, for instance, 80, 90% of the investment in the digital space is done by the private sector. So what, what are the questions that we, we, we need to address? Taxation. Because this is becoming, uh, when you go in a country which have a very weak economy, the digital sector is an easy sector to tax Absolutely. and to be able to get more, more resources. So we have this tension of the Minister of Finance which tells you, okay, I need to tax this sector very much, but also I need to make sure that the sector uh, develops. So we, 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 we have been in situations where uh, at a point where we needed to increase the investment in tower on 4G, yeah. some companies were saying, okay, listen, it's becoming more and more difficult for us to do that because taxation. So we need to have the right balance on taxation. Public policy on cybersecurity for me is, is, is uh, critical. Data localization. You have also a debate about 
uh, every country should be keeping their data in the geographic, geographical space and not allowing to go to, to the cloud because uh, of uh, data nationalism, all these questions that you know. So these questions are important questions yeah, because sure. there will be in the future uh, uh, an obstacle. Protection of, of, of consumer. One of the things which is very important now is all this thing of facial recognition, uh, all these type of application. You'd be surprised that some countries, the marginal uh, uh, data is very important. If you have, uh, let me, for the sake of it, uh, a, a lot of data which is, uh, which is a physical characteristic or racial characteristic, and you have very little data on people of my complexion or my physical characteristic. In fact, the algorithms which are written are often not uh, 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 serving everybody. So more and more, data that we'll be collecting in the developing countries, I think we have a more important value to be able to be able to serve us. So in all this conversation, as you rightly said, it's important that the least developed country at the public level have a good policy framework to be able to think through those issues, protect the consumer, and not to do it in, a, in, a, in an after, uh, uh, afterthought, and also to make sure that they are part comfortably of the world economy on the cloud economy without worrying about those data being hacked on the, and those. Uh, something I learned in the past 20 years as a journalist is that uh, I do a better job when I talk less and I listen more. <laughs> so I think it's a perfect time to, to ask uh, the audience uh, if they have a question and, and uh, if we can pass around the microphone or if you can just identify yourself. So if, if anybody has a question, please uh, go ahead. Raise your hand. If not, we can. Oh, please, thank you so much. Uh, George Vredenberg, the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. We're beginning to develop the infrastructure of how to detect cognitive impairment around the world. And so I'm going to come back to your notion of data security and privacy and nationalism, because beginning to get into the health services area, uh, we're going to have to get personal uh, health information on individuals. Governments uh, for protecting their own citizens are not sure that they want that aggregated in some global fashion. But it would be useful to compare how cognitive impairment occurs in Africa uh, as the United States. So we need to begin to compare and contrast that information in ways. So I'm curious as how you're, you're in the health space, how you're getting past this notion of uh, trying to guard against the export of data, a la EU. Uh, and other countries uh, as we begin to look at how to nationalize or globalize these uh, health services? I think we're still in version one, that people have uh, countries are so, because we're so naive countries, you know, in terms of cybersecurity and data, that they're, uh, that they're overcompensating and saying that everything has to be localized. And in doing so, w once the realization comes, there could be areas like, um, if we can anonymize it properly, and actually, uh, I, I think that this is this is where uh, you know this uh, the Bitcoin concepts and and all this thing of uh, data mining and blockchain. Uh, if we can really put a good blockchain in 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 process, uh, a lot of this information can go out uh, while keeping the privacy of of the uh, of, of the user. Because at the end of the day. Uh, I would not mind my data being used for the good of humanity as long as it was not used against me <laughs> by the insurance company or my banks not giving me a loan or, or uh, increasing my insurance. Very simplistic. But I really feel if we, can, if we can apply more principles of blockchain, and I think that's where version two will go when countries will start uh, appreciating how we can protect. It seems to be a, a good problem to have because then you'll reach a scale in which this is becoming uh, problematic, right? Uh, and it's I, I think that in some ways it's probably essential. The reason that we were able to find uh, a cure for, uh, for, for COVID uh, in 354 days is because, country, uh, because everyone collaborated. Yeah. So if, if the problem is big enough, we'll find it. Well, I, I mean, at least in my country, the Netherlands, it's already happening. You have a very stringent policy uh, framework, and you have open databases for many of the research issues, and they are completely uh, anonymized uh, data. So I think it's very possible. Now, um, how, I know that a lot of people say, if you know 300 points of information 
of one person, you will know who that person is. <laughs> um, so it is something we really need to think about, and that we, when we actually get all those pieces of information on any given uh, patient, that we don't go back to one person that we can actually, you know, negatively influence that person. But certainly something to be thought of. But it's not that right now um, this is really happening. I mean, most now, right now, that data has been owned by one hospital. <laughs> Or oh, one company, one place, and they do not share data. In the Netherlands, we did for the first time the only one institution that every cancer patient has to give the DNA of their tumor, and they give it for research. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. We have 70,000 new cancer cases per year, and we try to do this as a public good. Now, I know that in other countries, every hospital keeps their own cancer data because they want to do their own research because that's, their, of course, they monetize on that research. So it, I think that we need to think is, you know, how do we keep that data agency while sharing a, the monumental sort of research type of data where we actually derive knowledge from? Please, go ahead. Hi, I'm Sachin Dougal from Builder.ai. Um, when we think about some of the items being discussed, and you think about what's happening in the startup and the scale-up space, how do you think young companies can help, especially when uh, valuations from revenues generated in emerging markets are at a far lower multiple than those generated in developed markets? And it's a capital issue as well, because capital into early stage tech doesn't really find home in emerging markets. <laughs> who, who, has a t who has a take but, on that? Okay, so, uh, so let me, I, can, I, I can always uh, use yeah. the power of the moderator and, and, and assign the question. The, <laughs> and, and all this question, if you had asked it 10 days ago, is very different from the answer you have <laughs> so, <laughs> so, No, we, 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 uh, we are created at, at IFC a, a, a disruptive technology fund, which we aims at, at exactly at take some uh, uh, help uh, those startups which are interesting. Just to just to go out of uh, of the, what we're discussing, the kind of things that we are doing, uh, food waste. We talk about climate change. We talk about a lot of emissions. We don't talk uh, enough about food waste. And if you look at uh, the impact of on climate change on the poor farmers in the, in developing countries, having a solution which allows you to protect the, the the product is very helpful. For instance, we invest in a company which has an, uh, a, a, a a product which is covering. The, the vegetables or fruits and keep them much longer than they would have done. So this type of intervention is something that we are working and we are working also with MIT uh, uh, where they have also uh, uh, a group of uh, engineers which are working for development and this is the kind of initiatives that we are developing and we are trying to develop the ecosystem in emerging economies to be able to have that connection between those, those uh, more advanced economy development fund but also uh, linking it to things which matter for people's life in developing countries. Uh, Hans, you, you get the last word. Yeah, yeah the only uh, thing I would say, I mean, uh, first of all, first, it's about, uh, of course, the purpose you have for the company, uh, what you want to do. But uh, if you want to scale and make uh, profit uh, very quickly, there's also ways you can help. Because sometimes you actually start with the more richer countries, and when you have the scale there, then you can bring it to these areas. I think about mobile phones, I mean, that started costing, I'm not sure, $10,000 the first mobile phone in, in Saudi Arabia and Sweden. Uh, and of course, that's where it started. And then you scale it, and then you can have it in the rest of the world. So there's still parts how you can help, even though you need to start in a sort of a capital market that is coming your way. Uh, uh, but it's a thinking how you want to scale it. Because I think that many of the solutions you start with in healthcare as well, they start in certain markets, and then they go to the rest of the world. I think the best uh, outcome of, of our conversation today is that it is to be continued. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank Queen Maxima again for uh, being here today. Thank you so much for your insights. Of course, uh, Magda, thank you uh, for your presence. Hans Besberg and uh, Shobana Kimeneni, you're great. You made my job easy. Thank you so much. No, thank, you. thank you.